Welcome to worship here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church, where we seek to be followers of Jesus who love God here in worship, love others in small groups, and who serve the world in mission. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here. Our associate pastor, Annalise, is teaching one of our small groups during this hour, so I know you'll miss her. If you're new here, uh, there's a green card in the pew in front of you that you can fill out. Give us some contact information. Let us know that you're here. Uh, we just like to say hello and follow up with you. For those of you online, welcome. We're glad you're here as well. Please check in, give us prayer requests, say hello. We just want to know that you're with us. I, I see some of your names. It's great to have you with us in worship. Now let us continue in a spirit of worship as we sing together. Better is one day.
please be seated as we invite Jason to read our morning scripture. Today's scripture comes from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you've come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took calf tender and good and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk from the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, they are in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind them. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Oh, my goodness. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. Um, so, thank you for coming up here this morning. I just want to do a little quiz. Anybody um, about to start school again or for the first time in a few weeks? Yeah, we got some of us. Okay. Just want to, I, I thought about doing this, but I thought maybe nobody would come. I thought about just standing here like this as you came forward. What would you think if my back was to you and you came forward? Anybody? Would you feel welcome? You... What, Charlie? Would you feel welcome if I stood with my back to you? No, you wouldn't. Especially if I didn't talk to you at all, right? So you're going to be going back to school, some of us. Some of us meet friends in the neighborhood, right? Right? One of the nicest things to do is to say hello. In the story, Abraham and Sarah welcomed people that they'd never met before. They welcomed strangers into their home, and they shared a meal. And they ended up hearing good news. And it turned out one of those strangers was God. Now, don't expect you to meet God in the school cafeteria this year, but you might meet a new friend. And in a sense, you might experience God's love through somebody new that you've never met before. And you know what it begins with? Can you say it with me? It's called hello. Can you say that with me? Hello. Can you try it again? Because I didn't hear much. Can you say hello with me? Hello. Yeah, good. It's a nice little word. It just says, hi, we might be friends one day. And you might, you might have a friend for life because you said hello. Okay? Let's pray together. God, thank you for meeting us where we are. Thank you for sharing your love with us. And help us, Lord, to help other people feel welcome by simply saying hello. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. You can go back to your folks now. Got a lively group today. Um, we're about to show our love for God through our giving, and we always like to let you know that your giving through Braddock Street Church makes a difference in many, many ways. We are one of the larger supporters of the Congregational Community Action Project, also known as CCAP here in our community. And uh, you need to know that one of the reasons CCAP exists is because of what you simply do today by showing your love for God through your giving. I want to invite the ushers to come forward now.
Thanks, band. That was, that was wonderful. Sure. Well, good morning. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church. And today we start a new worship series entitled Invitation. We're going to be looking at how we are ready for guests this fall um, who may want to come and eventually be a part of the body of Christ, maybe even our own congregation. And today we're going to start with the simple gift of hospitality. Let us pray. Mm. Thank you, God, that you invite us to this place and we get a chance to connect with you. Thank you for those reflections of you, your love that we see in our neighbors. Lord, open our hearts and our minds that we might answer the high calling of being that reflection of love for someone else. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I want you to imagine this morning three strangers outside your house. It's the heat of the day. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's 90-something out there. I know nobody here knows what that's like, but they're just standing there. What do you do? You peek through the curtains? You begin to ask yourself questions who they might be. Are they Mormons? No, they don't have on white shirts and ties. Are they Jehovah's Witnesses? Eh. Oh, do they have flyers? They might be wanting me to buy replacement windows or tell me who to vote for, you know. Gosh, whatever they are, I hope they don't ring the doorbell. Fifteen minutes go by, they're still there. Do you call the neighbor? Have you noticed those folks out there? Do you know what they're up to? At what point do you think we should call the police? That's kind of how we react in our modern society. Of course, things are completely different if you have a front porch and you're actually sitting on it. You know, then you're face to face. You can't hide behind the curtains. So you probably are kind enough to say hello. And they're kind enough to say hello back. And then all of a sudden it's a different picture. There's no more suspicion. You know, they're not going to bite you. Now, in ancient times, ancient Near Eastern custom was that you showed hospitality to people. So thinking about Abraham, flip it around the other way. You're one of those strangers out somebody's house, and the person on the front porch sees you and runs towards you and invites you to a meal. Do you run? I mean, the reality of our society is we're much more introverted. We go to work, we go to school, we have all these activities, we get home and we just want to go, Lord, I hope nobody rings the doorbell, right? Have you noticed we build decks on almost every house now on the back, in the backyard? And we build, we build fewer and fewer front porches. And if we build front porches, chances are not many people are actually sitting on them. Most of us today want privacy. In Abraham's time, hospitality, offering somebody a meal to a stranger, that was, that was a well-entrenched custom. You were expected to do that. Now it's different. After all of our busyness, we just want to relax. But the Lord appeared to Abraham, the scripture reads this morning, by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He's on his front porch, if you will. And it's hot. Because he's got no air conditioning, that's one of the cooler spots to be. And he, says, he sees three strangers, and this is how the Lord appears. We read it in verse 2 of chapter, of chapter 18. He, Abraham, looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. There's a lot about this, fun, this story that just makes me laugh. And this is one of them. Maybe it's because I'm getting older, but when I read about somebody in the Bible who's about 100 years old, who's running, it makes me laugh inside. He got up from his front porch and ran to meet them. Like I said, nowadays, somebody did that to us as we walk by their house, we're running the other way. But he wants to show hospitality. In the heat of the day, a hundred-year-old man goes and runs to meet strangers. And he continues in verses 4 and 5, Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, you know, and be blessed in your journey or whatever. Let me bring a little bread and water. 
nothing big. And he takes him up, uh, they take him up on his offer. But Abraham goes beyond what he promised. Instead of offering bread and water, he runs into the tent and says, Sarah, start cooking. Now, I first read that and I'm like, oh gosh, Sarah's got to do all the work. No, but he does go out to the herd. He runs out to the herd and selects a calf and asks his servant to prepare the calf. All of this when he doesn't know who these people are. They're strangers. As the story progresses, we find out they're not just ordinary strangers. The Hebrew noun for my Lord, the first, his first address, is like you and I would say, sir, you know, a term of respect. The noun takes on a little different version. By the end of the story, we know it is the Lord, the Lord God Almighty that he's talking to. The other two, un- most likely, angels with a message. Even not knowing who it is, Abraham exceeds all expectations in his hospitality. And remember, the entire covenant hangs in the balance here. If you don't know, the covenant was, first of all, people. Abraham and Sarah were to have so many descendants. They were to be the father and mother of the nation of Israel. So many as the stars of heaven, God promised. And here they are a hundred years old, and they've had no children. The covenant is hanging in the balance. We're not told, but you wonder how much, it, how much is laying on how Abraham and Sarah respond to these strangers in the first place. Because if you go on to chapter 19, you get not only a lack of hospitality, you get violence to two of the angels on the part of the people of Sodom. And the judgment upon them is doled out like it becomes a byword of punishment. The worst thing God has ever done any. any any kind of punishment to anyone. Other than that, this is a hilarious story. I love Sarah's laughter. Um, After I preached at the 845 service, two women who shall remain nameless, one said to the other, well, one thing I got out of that sermon is, and these are women of more seasoned years, (laughs) she said, one thing I got out of the sermon is, if three strangers are outside your door, by God, don't answer the door implying that you might be pregnant, you know, by the time the story's over. (laughs) I love Sarah's laughter. Their child, who will be born later, is named Isaac, which literally in Hebrew means laughter or he laughs. Can you imagine, by the way, going through middle school with that name? (laughs) Going into the cafeteria, meeting somebody for the first time. What's your name? Laughter. There's so much humor in all this, but, but Sarah's laughter is the laughter of disbelief, you know? It's like she hears the announcement through, through the curtain, through the tent, Sarah's going to have a child. <laughs> Mister, if you only knew. Abraham told me about that promise decades ago, and we lived on that promise. We, we came to this land on that promise, and it's been decades and it has broken my heart, similar to women who would love to have a child but cannot. In fact, bringing it up again, it's an insult. You just made me hurt all over again. <laughs> if you only do, knew about me having a child. It's the laughter of disbelief because this has been decades and Abraham and Sarah's hopelessness has become normal for them. Do you get that? Just, not only do I not have hope, I gave up on hope a long time ago. And this is how we live day to day. Nothing good's going to happen for us. Do you know anybody like that? Maybe there's somebody here in the room like that. She laughs in disbelief. And I, I, I love it in part because I identify with it. I think if we're honest with ourselves, you know, we have to question ourselves. Do we really believe God does miracles through ordinary people like you and me anymore? Has our hopelessness become normal? Sarah tries to deny it. She doesn't know that one of the strangers is actually God himself until he later says, oh yeah, you did laugh. But in the middle of this, the Lord says this in chapter 18, verse 14. In the face of her disbelief, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? I want you to hang on that for a minute. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Do you believe that God can do miracles? Do you believe God can 
bring healing to your life and hope to your life? Walter Brueggemann, in his commentary on this passage, has a beautiful quote. He says, this is the question around which this confrontation revolves. It is an open question which waits for an answer. It is the question which surfaces everywhere in the Bible. We must say it is the fundamental question for every human that every human person must answer. And how it is answered determines everything else. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? It waits for an answer. It's, can you imagine being in the face of God and God saying, do you believe I can do miracles? And then God just remains silent. Any of you who teach, you know that awkward silence when you ask a student something and you're waiting for them to try some kind of answer. And if you're a student, you know how awkward that is. Oh, I don't know the answer. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? It's a faith question. Do we believe God can do amazing things? It's a question that gets in our face. What kind of a God do you think I am? Is the God that you have imagined in your mind too small? Unable to do anything? And you wonder, in this encounter, in this miracle, a renewal of the promise, restoring hope for Abraham and Sarah all over again, you wonder what they might have missed if they had not shown hospitality. We rarely think of the consequences that you and I face when we are not welcoming and hospitable to other people, especially in church. I remember when I was answering my, my call to ordain ministry, and I thought, okay, I'm not going the way my brother did as a doctor. I'm not going the way my other brother did as a banker. I'm not going to make as much money as they will. What's the benefit here? And you know what came? It came quick, real quick, because my father had been a pastor, and I knew you meet the best people in the world in church. You do. These relationships are everything, friends, and they mean everything to us. To come with people who will wrestle with questions of faith, encourage one another, We rarely think of the consequences of us just not saying hello to somebody that we haven't met before. For many people in this world, maybe somebody in this room, hopelessness has become normal. And I want you to understand, every time you see a new face in church, there's a reason they're here for the first time. Oh yes, I know some of you are going, they might go to the other service. Just forget that. Just say hello. Whether they go to the other service or you've never... But assuming they've never been to any of our worship services before or been in any of our small groups or you've had... If they're at church for the first time, think about why. They may have been... They may be new to the community and they're looking for simple answers to questions like, you know any good doctors because my daughter has such and such, you know? Or what's a good grocery store? Just simple things. They're new. Their life, for one reason or another, and it's usually a major life change, has been transplanted from one place to another. They are retired, they've got a new job, they've moved to a whole new community, and they are hungry for relationships. That's one of the possible reasons. Another one is they may have been hurt or disappointed by another congregation. This might be the place for them where they can restore their faith, find some healing in their relationship with God. That's a very important thing, isn't it? And then there are those personal crises that happen in life. Loss of a job, grief. You know, all these things might be, and they're coming from a sense of hopelessness. Oh, please, show me somebody. Is there somebody here that also believes that nothing is too wonderful for the Lord? Let's look at it again. There's that verse. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Somebody, please, help me heal my broken heart. Show me hope in God again. I also love Sarah's laughter. Because she's obviously not ready for the good news that's coming. She's not ready for, the, for that to be fulfilled. Faith-wise, she just doesn't believe it's going to happen, and God does it anyway. Isn't that cool? What God is going to do is not ultimately dependent upon us. And yet, I wonder, what would God have done if they didn't show hospitality? Would they have missed out? They get violence, the angels get violence in Sodom, and there's The heavy hand of God's divine punishment comes down. So there is some kind of consequence. Would would God have still honored the promise with Abraham and Sarah if they had not shown basic hospitality to a stranger? We're not really told. 
But we know that the book of Hebrews picks up this very story in this famous quote, Hebrews 13, 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. I kind of want to be blunt today. I, I don't see a whole lot of folks that I don't know this morning, um, and I, that's kind of the case during summer. I know who's here. Here are the folks who've been through the pandemic. Here are the folks who've been through all the other stuff. You're still here. You're the good, committed, wonderful people, the people that I signed up to meet Jesus with, right? But I want us to be prepared because in a few weeks, oh, sorry kids, school will be back in session. And there are some people, there are some families, you know, vacation time is kind of ending, and there'll be people coming back who haven't been with us for a while, you know, vacations, whatever. And there'll be some who haven't been in church for a long time. And they'll say this fall, as we form our routines for the fall, some folks will say, hey, let's try making church and God a part of that routine again. We will see, undoubtedly, some new faces. Children, teenagers, adults, whatever. And I want us to be ready. To be ready to simply say, hello, welcome. It is absolutely imperative that we be ready to do so. So, sorry introverts, I'm going to ask us to do a little test right now, okay? I'm just going to ask you to stand, wait for it, I'm going to give you some instructions because last time I couldn't pull them back together. Just stand and say hello or it's nice to see you if that works. I'm trying to give the introverts some words here, okay? Uh, try and find that, that phrase that you always hear like, like at Chick-fil-A when you say thank you and they always say my pleasure, right? I want you to find that my pleasure phrase, that automatic phrase of simple greeting, okay? Because it makes all the difference. I'm going to have you stand, look at the person in front of you, turn around to the person to your right, you know, just go around in a circle, don't get up and cross the aisles, you know? Because <laughs> we're going to do this for 15 seconds. Just say hello or whatever to the people around you. Go. Okay, time's up. Time's up. Sorry. You're too friendly. Time's up. Come back. Come back before I start calling names. Come back. <laughs> Jeff's up here going, you lost them. It's true. Now, didn't that, didn't that feel good? Sorry, I apologize to the introverts. I know it didn't for you. But didn't that fe- make it feel like a warmer space just instantly? Why is that so important? There's a gentleman that I read, um, he's Baptist, his name is Tom Rayner. He uh, just kind of studies trends and so forth. If you're, if you're a longtime committed Methodist, you probably heard the word, the name Love It Weems. He's the guy that does that at Wesley Seminary for a lot of us Methodists. Tom Rayner's kind of like the Baptist Love It Weems. Anyway, writes a lot of good stuff. And in one of his recent studies, he listed actually the top ten, but I'm just going to give you the top two. And I want you to notice the top two reasons why people might not come back to a church they visited. And very quickly, you will notice, has nothing to do with the preaching, has nothing to do with the music. Number one, an unfriendly and awkward stand and greet time in the worship service. <laughs> You're laughing. You get it. We used to do that. And I think this, this crew did a pretty good job of it. I don't think it was that awkward or unfriendly. But here's what Tom Rayner said about that. He said, when I first saw this response coming in by the hundreds, I was surprised. But as I dug deeper, I discovered there were two issues with the stand and greet time. First, some guests just felt awkward with the exercise. I think you can label introverts right there in that group. It seemed to be a ritual more for the members than for the guests. Secondly, a number of guests did not mind the stand and greet time, but they felt left out during the welcome. Either they were totally ignored or they were inundated with what they perceived were superficial greetings. See, here's human nature. Most churches identify themselves as a friendly church because we're friendly with each other. But we're not always paying attention to a face we've never seen before because it's natural for us to congregate with the people around us. Listen to reason number two. Unfriendly church members 
Tom Rayner writes, most church members do not view themselves from the perspective of church guests. They don't usually speak to guests because they don't know them. And the church members usually retreat to the comfort of the holy huddles of the people they do know. I love that phrase, holy huddles. I mean, I love those spaces. You, you come back to church and you see so-and-so, you hadn't seen them this week, or maybe you've been on vacation, it's been a few weeks, you know, it's just good to catch up. But imagine if we've got a group of three, four, five of us in one of the aisles, and somebody that we've never met is coming down that aisle and has to kind of, you know, find their way around you or through you. Imagine if you don't speak. How does that feel? You feel ignored. You feel like you don't matter. And again, they may be coming here because something important is going on in their life. Oh God, please show me somebody who still believes that there's nothing too wonderful for God. I need that. And a simple hello can make all the difference. Just like on the front porch, if you're on the front porch and they're strangers and you're kind enough to just say hello, so much suspension and tension just go away. I'm trying to get us to just recognize basic hospitality. Not to go out and kill the fatted calf and, you know, bring in milk and curds, but just to say hello, to be friendly, to just recognize people with a simple word that works also for introverts like hello. It's nice to see you. I'm glad you're here. You, you can, those of us that can read people, you'll know some introverts will be, nice to see you too, you know, and don't intrude. Here's what happened to when my wife first attended the church that I was serving at the time. I started serving as a pastor as a single young man. I was attending seminary. There were 35. Later, there were 40. We had massive church growth. We went from 35 to 40 people a Sunday, you know, and they all knew each other. They'd all grown up together. So my wife, we'd started dating, and she figured, okay, if I'm going to marry this guy one day or if I'm, we're going to get serious, I need to know something about what he believes, let me attend his church. So she shows up. She, she'd never been in Halifax County, Virginia before. I mean, you, you're in a church where you'll see some new faces. This was a place you didn't see any new faces. Somebody new stood out like a sore thumb. And Hilda, we will never forget, found her immediately after the last hymn note had reverberated through that little church. She ran to my wife and said, tell me everything about yourself. Fortunately, she was well-adjusted enough, you know, and recognized the dynamics. But Hilda and her husband, Donald, became among our best friends in that congregation. They were wonderful. But you understand, you don't want to pounce upon people. Because we're in a different culture than Abraham and Sarah now. A lot of folks just visit. They want to check it out. Please don't approach me. I just want to see what it's like. And I may or may not come back next week. You can also go to the other extreme. I wish I had known John Hawes' parents. I don't even know their, their first name. Some, of, say, some folks who've been in this church for a while recognize where I'm going with this. But I wish I had met them because now I run into all kinds of people in Braddock Street Church who say, the reason I'm here is because of John Hawes' parents. We came, we visited, and they, they took us to lunch right after church. They wanted to make sure we felt welcome. They wanted to get to know us. They were genuinely, you know, showed caring for us when we were still strangers. And I just said, I met all these people years and years and years later. Your simple hello or act of, of hospitality can make a difference in somebody's life for a lifetime. It can build from there. We don't think about the consequences of speaking to somebody that we've never met before. Abraham and Sarah showed hospitality. They extended hospitality themselves and look who was more blessed not the strangers but Abraham and Sarah their faith was renewed they, their hope was restored how might you be blessed by somebody that at this point you've never met before you don't know the Lord appeared to Abraham in the face of a stranger God might even appear to you in a similar fashion after all is anything too wonderful for the Lord next time Say hello. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for these marvelous relationships that we find in church, people who are kind and generous and who support us. Um, may we be that same kind of person for someone else. But Lord, let us be 
attentive to the faces that we are seeing for the first time. Let us be attentive to whatever might be going on in their life. At the very least, let us extend greetings that they might feel welcome in the house of God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. These prayers we offer in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand as we are able and sing together, You Never Let Go. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out the air. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. And I will be.
joining us for worship today. It's just been good to be with you, and I, I do really genuinely love seeing you each and every Sunday, shaking hands and saying hello. It's just great to connect. In, uh, on April, excuse me, August 19, we'll be having our block party, and we want you to come. First of all, it's a Saturday, 10 a.m. to 1. Uh, come, bring a friend somebody that doesn't know all the great things that Braddock Street Church is doing in our community. It's a great way to do that. Um, secondly, you probably noticed the stanchions in the back with the iPads on them. We're not using those today. No, they're not functioning today, but that's how we're going to start letting you check in when you come in on a Sunday morning. We're going to replace the old registration of attendance pads that we used to pass down the pew, you know, and we can immediately see who's been with, with us and who might be missing for a while so we can catch up. But now go. Knowing that a simple hello, an extension of your own natural hospitality might be an expression of God's love for somebody else and has the potential to change a life. Somebody did that for you. Go with the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.